die Kamera ein bisschen höher. Ähm, sorry. Ach, so viel Ach, wir haben first Kino Speaker. Uh, we have, uh, from Seattle, um, King Missouri's of Microsoft. Uh, I don't think you need introduction. <laughs> Everybody knows you, so. Um, give her a big round of applause uh, and let's start this conference. Okay, thank you. Can everyone hear me? Yes. <laughs> So it is my honor and pleasure to be here at BrewCon 2012. This is my first BrewCon. So thank you so much for inviting me, Wim, and thank you to all the organizers for making this a spectacular conference. I've heard great things about it. So I'm really excited to be here. I had planned on staying for the entire conference, but unfortunately some polls back home um, are making me leave right after, very shortly after this. So if you want to come talk to me, come quick right after, uh, right after my speech, because I've got to go. Um, so, Wim said, I'm, I'm Katie Masaurus, and he said that I didn't need an introduction, but actually part of my speech is sort of an introduction. Um, they invited me here to speak, I assume because of my age, perspective, and age. Um, but some of you may know me in the context of the past few years at Microsoft, where I had a Microsoft Security Community Outreach and Strategy Team. So what that basically means is that I help Microsoft understand and work with the hacker community uh, which Microsoft prefers to call the security researcher community. Pick your term. I enjoy the term hacker. Uh, before Microsoft, I did spend about seven years as a pen tester, uh, first as an independent security consultant, and then as one of the artists formerly known as At Stake. After Symantec acquired At Stake, a bunch of us uh, would jokingly refer to ourselves as SimStake because things just weren't the same. But before, uh, but now I'm a security strategist. And my team at Microsoft runs the international or the, inter, no, the internal hacker conference called Blue Hat, an idea pioneered by Windows Snyder when she worked at Microsoft. And that's where we invite hackers like yourselves to come in and scare, I mean educate the executives and engineers of Microsoft on current and emerging threats. So at Microsoft, I also founded a Microsoft's third party vulnerability research program, or MSVR, and hundreds of vulnerabilities have been fixed through that program since 2008. As an individual, this is a strange area for me, but I managed to convince the ISO community to elect me as the editor of an upcoming standard on vulnerability handling. So basically, these are all the processes that vendors have to follow when either they themselves find a vulnerability in their code and they have to <coughs> triage it and remediate it, um, or whether or not a, a hacker from the outside has found and reported a vulnerability to them. So, last year we launched something called the Blue Hat Prize, and this was the first defense-oriented competition uh, aimed at finding new runtime mitigations for open problems in modern exploitation, like return-oriented programming. No, so, problem, no. these exploitation techniques, as you know, can be used to bypass the current best mitigations of any platform. Didier Stevens, who's actually uh, running uh, the Windows X64 do, workshop a little later today, was one of the excellent contestants, so you should definitely check out his workshop. He's one of the uh, current premier experts on uh, Windows exploitation. Um, and you should check out his interview with Blue Hat. So now you know what I do for Microsoft. Um, let me take you back a few years. So you had told me a decade ago that I'd eventually be working for Microsoft. On top of that, I'd spend some time in the ISO, as, as an ISO okay, standards um, editor. I would have laughed. I would have turned back to my OpenVSC or Linux box and piped your wacky prediction to dev null. But something surprising happened in the intervening years. Something uh, besides me getting really old. I allowed my curiosity to be, as I always have. And to my surprise, it led me right to Microsoft's front door. Which is surprising considering at the time the back doors were so tempting. But let me take you back a few more years. Many of you are probably too young to remember a world without Microsoft or Apple or Google or any of these big major players that we have and we take for granted in the world today. But my first computer was a Commodore 64. How many of you? Commodore 64s. All right, so there are a few people out there who are about my age. So. <laughs> now I feel old. <laughs> So uh, to play with this new toy that my mom bought me, it required some of those skills that we all bring to the table, some patience, experimentation, and curiosity. You know, your basic ingredients of hacking. So I had long before had all the electronic devices uh, taken out of my reach and all the screwdrivers hidden in the house because of my fascination with uh, taking apart electronic devices. Um, 
guessing a number of you have that same curiosity still today. And lucky for you, Fabienne does too, and she is running two hardware workshops. There she is. Um, so you should definitely check that out here at the conference. Um, so I had to focus my curiosity on learning something new, and I didn't have anyone to teach me, unlike we have today at conferences here at BrewCon. Um, I had to focus on peaks, pokes, and sprites, and it sounds perfect for a kid learning how to program. Um, I also had to look up the meaning of the word syntax because I kept getting those kinds of errors. So I learned basic, wrote some programs, um, and after coding up a Zork-like text-based adventure game based on Choose Your Own Adventure books, I realized it really wasn't much fun solving puzzles for which I already knew the answers. There was no fuel for my curiosity in that. And if it weren't for the burgeoning technology that was just beginning, the internet that was just beginning, uh, that would network my computer with others, my curiosity would never have found its purchase in computing again, and I would have ended up as a biochemist, like my mother. So aside from sharing some nostalgia with you, how does that relate to our world today? In our world of computer security, both sides of security coin must advance for any of us, attackers or defenders, to have any fun. You know, I hear this debate all the time. Attack is harder, defense is harder. It actually doesn't really matter, because frankly, both sides need each other to advance, to have fun, or else you know the answers to all the puzzles already. So each side presents a new challenge to the other, fueling each other's curiosity in this cat and mouse battle royale that's going to outlast us all, no matter how old we are. So it only stops being fun when you know the answers. And by challenging each other on the offense and defense of computers, we're playing in an incredible choose-your-own-adventure game, one that may or may not result in being eaten by a group. Fast forward a few more years, my curiosity around the newborn internet, although that's not what it was called then, led me through the phone wires to a bulletin board system run by some of the earliest computer hackers in the Boston area. These people followed their curiosity to the extreme. This is something that's encouraged at events like this at BrewCon and other events around the world at hacker spaces um, where you follow your curiosity to its natural conclusions. So challenging each other, challenging the status quo, these folks not only lived to tell the tale, but they were openly sharing their knowledge. These were my kind of people. So to this day, I can still recall my delight upon meeting some of them at my first 2600 meeting. And how many of you got your start at a local 2600 meeting? Okay, two of you. <laughs> So at this point, I can fast forward you again, vaulting over this dalliance that I had with biochemistry and mathematics. But I think it's actually important to share some key inspiration I encountered during those years. Computer science is a very young field, and computer security is even younger. But at that time, I was fortunate enough to have worked in another very young field, molecular biology, working on the Human Genome Project. And what initially caught my eye during my undergraduate studies was the paper that started the genetic revolution. This groundbreaking 1953 paper by Watson and Crick, you may have heard of them, described the biochemical double helix structure of DNA. It piqued my curiosity like no other paper I had read up until the time because of one phrase used at the end of the paper, which I'm going to share with you. This paper had a similarly revolutionary effect on the biochemistry community, much like all of one's paper on stack-based buffer overflows, smashing the stack for fun and profit, had a delightfully destabilizing effect on computer security effects which are seen and felt to this day. So when describing the fact that they had only scratched the surface of science and genetics, and that there was more work to be done, Watson and Crick said, it has not escaped our notice that the specific pairing we have postulated immediately suggests a possible copying mechanism for the genetic material. That sentence was the understatement of the century. The phrase, it has not escaped our notice, was a wry challenge that these biochemist hackers issued to the rest of the scientific community. They had rushed their work, racing to beat a prominent chemist named Linus, Linus Pauling, that is. They knew that there was so much more to do, and with that phrase, they alluded to the fact that their initial work was a profound portal into even greater scientific discoveries and advancements. In saying, it has not escaped our notice, they invited the world to play in their own choose-your-own-adventure game. At the time of their discovery, Watson was in his early 20s, prime hacking age, and Crick was older, so 
about 35, but he was exploring a new field. He had been a physicist. So his mind was open and curious as if it was just starting out. It's no coincidence that many of the boldest and most profound discoveries in any field are often at the hands of youth when their minds are in that synesthetic state where they can almost taste the music of their ideas. You'll be tasting some music later tonight at the party, I believe. And the areas of the brain responsible for judgment and risk-taking are not necessarily fully mature, and that's a good thing. They have the urge and the energy to challenge authority and the status quo. Hackers are wonderful in that they follow their curiosity and will boldly challenge authority and the status quo at every given opportunity. And without hackers discovering and sharing their knowledge of attacks, mainstream technology will continue to grow without ever developing an immune system to defend itself. We see this in the darker corners of our industry that have recently been exposed. Well, exposed to the mainstream. Those of us who have been around for a while have seen it coming. So, such as skater embedded systems, where a hacker can seemingly still party like it's 1999, or 1996, or 1987. Attackers will attack, so defenders need to listen to the hackers who have a knack for showing that the emperor has no clothes, and that it's really cold in the room. So even as I speak, the internet itself is profoundly different than it was a few short years ago. Now devices are talking to each other with no human interaction at a rate that if it keeps up will soon eclipse porn. This is serious, people. I am not just talking about tablets or smartphones and the profound societal effects of those small, affordable portals to the internet, from enabling the immediacy of social networks, updating what you ate that morning, to sparking and carrying waves of cultural revolution across newly awakened swaths of civilization. I'm talking, I'm including in this internet of things, your car, your pacemaker, your electric meter at your house, your running shoes. This internet of things is the same as the internet of PCs was just a short time ago. Huge and wide open to abuse. So the challenge is people who are passionate about security is to teach and reteach the lessons of the past, even as society embraces this new way of, in of interconnected devices before it really knows what kind of an adventure they have chosen. For those of you who played Zork, this is the point at which we can get LAMP, and thus hopefully once again dodge the GRU. The GRU in our world can also be translated as cyber -getting. So for those of you on the front lines of defense, it's not so much that you want to think of yourselves as the mouse to an attacker's cat. You need to be the mongoose to the attacker's cobra, a formidable foe capable of winning at least some of the time. And by winning, that could just mean making the attacks themselves as expensive for the attackers as they are for the defenders. Computer security defense as an industry is still more mouse than mongoose. But the field is young, and I have faith in the hacking community. Not only that we will find some great defenders among you, but that great attackers who use their skills wisely will be these symbiotic sparring partners in our industry's growth and evolution. I have faith that this community will turn its laser focus on technology's threats, whether those threats be technical, legal, policy-driven, or societal, so that we can all keep playing. We saw it with the recent uprising against botched attempts at laws like SOPA in the US and the corresponding laws here in Europe. I found that my hacker's curiosity has been focused by the patient's gains in my old age, and that Microsoft, even the ISO community, have become the levers by which I can help to move the world. Even Mudge and Dark Tangent work for the man now. They even admit they are the man now. My challenge to you today is to find your levers by which you can move the world. To be they in a hacker space where you experiment with hardware and software, or in a meeting room of a giant established organization where you may feel a little out of place, or better yet, do both. Do both, because it's places like Brucon that will give you a place to mingle them all, to talk about these ideas with, I'm sure, certain law enforcement contingents who are present here, I'm sure certain, certain policymakers are present here, myself included. But make your voice heard, find your lever, and don't be afraid to step into the boardroom, even if it feels a little icky at first. It's okay. You'll get over it. The point is that the security sea itself cannot swell without you filling it with new knowledge about both offense and defense. You don't just control the tides. As security folks, you are the sea, which is convenient if you're a pirate. So if 
few of you probably are. So pirate or patrol ship, <laughs> thanks. Pirate or patrol ship, you ride the wakes of each other's advances, each depending on each other to raise the challenge in order to leap forward. We depend on each other as attackers and defenders, and defenders cannot be decent defenders unless they understand attack. As hackers, you've only begun to scratch the surface of what is possible if you wield your influence with purpose and focus. And this, my BrewCon friends, is a fact that I believe has not escaped your notice. So with that, I'd like to let you all uh, perhaps ask me any questions that you might have. Otherwise, I'd like for you to enjoy this wonderful conference. And thank you again to the organizers. T-shirt. We're selling those as well at, re uh, at reception. They're only 20 euros. So anybody wants a unique Brucon T-shirt? Um, they are at re reception uh, limited edition. We have plain black ones as well. Um, thank you. So if you're too shy to ask me a question up here, I'll be around for a little bit before I have to go home. So thank you again. <laughs>